let's start working toward our formal definition of a group. So the first thing we need to look at is what is a binary operation? We have a set, and that set can be almost anything. A binary operation basically takes in two elements of that set and spits out another element of that set. The order could possibly matter. We already saw that with our symmetries of the square group. But let's take a look at a few other examples. Now it's important to realize that when we're doing this, we have to define what our set is. Certain th operations are binary operations on one set, but take the same exact operation with a different set, it's not a binary operation. So a simple little example would be, let's say our And let's take as our operation is our standard multiplication. Certainly, if we multiply any two integers, we get another integer. So, this is a good example of binary operation. Now, on the other hand, if I take the integers and I think about my operation being division, that's not a binary operation. Because if I do something as simple as 1 divided by 3, I don't get an integer back out. Always, if you put in two elements of your set, you've got to get out an element of your set. And one-third is not an element of the integers. Let's do one more example. And for this one, I'm going to go a little bit stretching things. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at my set G is the set that contains 0, 1, and 2. The set can be abbreviated as Z3. What my operation is, is going to be multiplication, but I'm going to mod it by 3. Now, what modular arithmetic does is it basically says, if you get a number bigger than 3, then you're going to subtract 3 until you get something that's either 0, 1, or 2. might be easiest to look at this just as going back to another Cayley table. There aren't very many elements here, so we can figure them all out. I've got 0, 1, and 2. 0, 1, and 2. 0 times 0 is 0. In fact, 0 times anything is 0. May as well put all those things in. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times 2 is 2. 2 times 1 is 2. But 2 times 2 isn't 4 when I take it mod 3. I get 4, subtract 3 from it, and so it actually gets me 1. So now, no matter what two elements I get, I'm always getting something in 0, 1, 2, or 3. 0, 1, or 2. Therefore, this is, in fact, a binary operation. Now that we understand what a binary operation is, now let's go on to what we really want, which is the definition of a group. OK. A little bit more complicated. Just like before, we have a set, and we've got a binary operation. And honestly, all this first part is is just kind of redefining, going through what a binary operation is. If we have that binary operation, there are three properties, then, that it has to have to be a group. The operation has to be associative. 
let's think back to our symmetries of the square. We had eight different symmetries of the square. Now, what that means is that if I were to go through and double check everything that there was, every possible case for associativity, we'd have to check 8 times 8 times 8 because A, B, and C all could be any one of the eight elements that there were. That gives us 512 different cases we've got to check. And for each one of those 512 cases, we've got to check both orders to see that they're the same, giving us over a thousand different calculations we've got to do. If you're bored, sure, go ahead and do it, but I certainly don't want to. And that brings us to a big point. Often when we're checking a group, especially for associativity, we want to rely on properties that we already know to help us establish these things. So for our symmetries of a square, I mentioned along the way that these were in fact functions. We know that function composition is associative. So right away, without checking even a single one out of those 512 cases, we know that that group of symmetries of a square is in fact associative. Next thing is there needs to be an identity. Again, we mentioned this when we were looking at the Cayley table, that that operation of just picking up the element, putting it back down, didn't actually do anything. It never changed what we were composing it with. We need an element like that for it to be a group. Finally, the third thing is that every element needs to have an inverse. Always, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, you need a way to kind of get back to where you started in one single move. Once again, we talked about how we, that could have, that was definitely true for the symmetries of the square. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at another group. Let's take, just like I was doing before, we'll say Z4, which is the set 0, 1, 2, and 3. And let's say our operation is addition mod 4. Once again, we can make a Cayley table very, very easily. Adding zero doesn't change anything. One and one is two, one and two is three, one and three is four, but that's on our set to do it mod four, subtract four, and we get zero. 2 and 1 is 3, 2 and 2 is 4, which we just said is 0. 2 and 3 is 5, taking it mod 4, we subtract 4 and get 1. 3 and 1 is 4, which is 0. 3 and 2 is 5, which is 1. 3 and 3 is 6, which is 2. I'm claiming that this is a group. It's associative because we're really just using basic addition here. Even though we're taking it mod 4, we're doing the basic addition property, and so even when we do that subtracting 4, we still get the same thing either way. There is an identity. Adding 0 doesn't change it, no matter what order we do things in. And there are inverses. 0 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 3 is 0. 2 plus 2 is 0. 3 plus 1 is 0. Every element has an inverse. 